Hello, everybody. I'm Ed Ayers from the University of Richmond, and we've got a challenge today. How are we going to explain the American Civil War and Reconstruction to the most complicated eras in American history in a little while? Well, let's find out. Now, part of the reason is, is because you already know a lot about the Civil War wherever you live. You know it was fought between what we call the North and the South, and you know it ended racial slavery in the United States. You know that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at the end of the war after he'd been a great president throughout that crisis, and that that assassination destroyed hopes for a peaceful reconstruction based on a just future for Black Americans. Now, in its general outlines, that story is not wrong, but it's misleading in some ways. First of all, it would be better to talk of the United States rather than the North. And it would be better to talk of the Confederacy rather than the South. For, as we will see, four million Black people in the South did not support the Confederacy. And many white people had voted against it at the beginning. The war was not between two sides with equal claims, the blue team and the gray team, like a ball game. Instead, it was filled with, with moral conflict and purpose. Also, we need to be careful about reading the Civil War backwards from its conclusion. The United States did end up destroying slavery, but it did not go to war to do so because that seemed impossible. Slavery in the United States was the largest and most powerful system of slavery in the modern world, worth more than all the banks and factories and railroads of the North combined. And slavery was growing and had never been more profitable than it was in 1860. Slavery would not have died on its own. But neither did the United States go to war because it was industrial and urban, whereas the South was agrarian. Instead, the United States depended on the cotton produced by enslaved people as its largest export. There was no so-called economic reason for the United States to go to war with its largest supplier. So set that formula, along with the North and the South, aside as well. And one final thing you need to forget, that the United States won because it had the most men and the most arms, and so winning was inevitable, merely a matter of time and wearing down the South. There were many points throughout the war when it seemed that the Confederacy would win the war. You need to remember that all the Confederacy had to do to win was for the United States to decide that keeping the slave states in the Union cost more than it was worth in lives. The Confederacy did not need to overwhelm the cities of the North or even to defend all of its territory. It merely needed for the voters of the United States to elect someone other than Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Now the war can seem like a list of battles, but it has to be understood in its political context. The Confederacy needed above all to remain a threat through the election of 1864, so that the United States would elect someone willing to let the Confederate states leave. We have to remember how battles and elections related if we're going to understand the war at all. And then there's Reconstruction, which has its own misconceptions. We'll get to that after the war is over. So let's go back to the key statement here. The Civil War can best be understood as three stories of the Confederacy, of the U.S., and of Black Americans. And we have to understand each story on its own and then in connection with the others. So it's a braided narrative, three major plot lines of three major groups of characters. The three plot lines twist around each other, shape the other, but they are distinct stories that must be understood as their own stories of challenges and struggles. Now, the first plot line is that of the would-be Confederacy, which initiated much of the action. Without white Southerners attempted secession, there is no war, and then there is no emancipation. The states of the Confederacy, they clearly announced, wanted to establish their own nation where the future of slavery could never be infringed upon or threatened. It was their right, they asserted, to leave the United States and to create a new nation unified by the presence of a large enslaved population. So everything began and ended with slavery. This slide 
is, it takes a little bit of getting used to. The areas that are varying shades of brown are where the black population of the South was growing. And the brighter the brown, the most rapid, more rapidly it was growing. So you can see here in the 1850s, the final decade before the Civil War, slavery has expanded across the Black Belt of Alabama and Mississippi and all up and down the Mississippi River and it's pushed deep into Texas. The areas that are blue are areas where the black population is declining. And there you can see the Upper South, Virginia, Kentucky, is a place that is still selling people into the domestic slave trade. And the same thing is even true for South Carolina. South Carolina is interesting here. You see areas where from in the low country where slavery is, uh, the numbers are declining, but in very nearby, it's rapidly increasing, partly because of cotton. Slave prices have never been higher than they are in the 1850s. And what you're seeing here is the final decade of the domestic slave trade. What you need to remember is that a million Americans were bought and sold as property in that domestic slave trade. And that this is population change. This is growth that's going on. By this time, for over half a century, black people have been sold in the largest slave state, which is Virginia. Even after all of the, the sales in which people your age, young men and young women, are basically culled from the population and taken to big slave markets in Richmond uh, and sold, and insured, and, and uh, mortgaged, uh, and then shipped on steamboats to New Orleans um, or over trains into the Deep South. So a million people are moved this way, another million are moved shorter distances. So as you're picturing slavery, you've got to picture something that is in constant motion. And what this means is all of this movement of black people into the deep south are there because white people have invested in them. They believe that the future lies with slavery. And what they meant was that they were emboldened by their prosperity. 1860, cotton prices have never been higher. Prices for enslaved people have never been higher. This is the bottom line, that the, the slave South believes that it can and should and must have the untrammeled right to keep expanding, maybe into Cuba, maybe farther west, maybe into other parts of Latin America, and it cannot be hedged in by uh, Northern efforts to stop it. So, you see this in the election of 1860. Now, often our textbooks have pictures that just show the North and the South, but it's important to understand that things were divided internally. You'll see two things. One we'll talk about a little bit later. The red here is Lincoln's party, the Republican party. The blue is Stephen Douglas's party, the Northern Democrats. But look at the South. You see two different parties there. One is purple. That's the strong Southern rights uh, candidate, John C. Breckinridge. The yellow is the Constitutional Union Party. Now that sounds like they were for the Union, but the emphasis is on the constitutional part, which means the Constitution sanctions slavery where it is. An interesting pattern is that those yellow areas, what we might think of as more conservative, are areas of largest slaveholding. You will remember the map we just looked at in which you saw uh, enslaved population growing along the Mississippi River. Well, you might think they would be in favor of secession, but those big slave owners are saying, look, we have what we want. We don't want to put it at risk by secession. And you see in Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, lots of places where the, the big slaveholders don't want to rock the boat. But the people in the purple areas are saying, well, that may be fine for you. You may have uh, the enslaved people that you want, but we don't, and we want to keep expanding. It's interesting, too, we think of today of Oregon and California as being very liberal, but you see here they're voting for the strong Democratic Southern candidate. So what you're seeing is that it's pretty complicated, and what it also explains is that the, the delay in what happened after this. So after the election of 1860, you found the states in the Deep South, the seven states along the Gulf Coast, seceded in December and January. But the states of the Upper South, and remember Virginia has more enslaved people than anybody, delay because they say several things. One, if there's going to be a war, let's guess where it's going to be. Second, uh, we don't grow cotton 
We don't really have that stake in it. Uh, and it's also the case that we helped create the United States not that long ago. Virginia wrote the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that was our grandfathers. We're not eager to leave. So they had big conventions. They debated this for a long time. And they voted over and over again not to leave. And North Carolina, Tennessee were watching Virginia to see what they did. But after the firing on Fort Sumter in April of 1865, 1861, they decided to join the Confederacy. One reason that the um, Virginia ends up being the capital, it was a kind of a bargaining. Hey, if you'll join us, Richmond can be the capital. The, concept, the, the result of that was that Richmond became the object of the war uh, for the next four years. Now, the thing is, the irony is the Confederates did not think that they were starting anything like what the Civil War became. They thought the U.S. would back down, faced with a unified South and an untested and inexperienced president. They did not foresee the United States willing and able to fight a war to force them to stay within the nation. They did not foresee a four-year war that would kill a quarter of the military age young white men of the Confederacy. They certainly did not see the end of slavery for four million enslaved people, virtually overnight and with no compensation for the former masters. The war the Confederacy started exacted enormous suffering. Over 750,000 Americans died. As a share of the population if that were today, that would be eight million people. Now the Confederate States seceded to create a new nation based on slavery. But ironically, they destroyed slavery in the only way that it could have died so quickly and so completely in a vast war. As a contemporary put it at war's end, the Confederacy had just committed the colossal suicide of modern history. So that's the story of the Confederacy. They risk everything to perpetuate what they have. The second plot line is that of the United States which went to war to defend its very existence. We need to remember that. White Northerners, despite their other differences, agreed that the United States could not be divided, that secession was illegal. And over the course of the war, the determination to save the Union grew stronger. But they argued over how to save it. The Democrats said it should be saved by compromising with the South. Let them have slavery, but let's don't destroy the United States. The Republicans said the Union must be saved, but by crushing the rebellion, by denying its legitimacy. Now, the Republicans did not say at the outset that slavery must be destroyed. Abraham Lincoln acknowledges that slavery could not be touched where it, where it currently was because of the Constitution. But once the war began, the United States discovered almost immediately that it could not save the Union without undermining and then destroying slavery. Slavery sustained the Confederacy, for one thing. Four million people working against their will to sustain the Confederate cause. For another, the United States quickly discovered that the Black population of the slave states could be valuable allies, and they desperately wanted to be free. African Americans, white and Black, petitioned the United States with hundreds of thousands of names to turn the war into a war to end slavery. So here was the central struggle for Abraham Lincoln. Without saving the United States, there could be no emancipation. But emancipation might divide the United States politically so much that it would give up the war. That was the tremendous pressure that Lincoln had to balance. And in many ways, that's what the war was about. Could Lincoln hold the United States together long enough to end slavery and save the Union? Now that looks unlikely in 1862, even though militarily, the U.S. establishes a huge advantage when it takes much of the Mississippi River in Tennessee. Now over time, that became even more important. But politically, what mattered more in 1862 was that the U.S. failed to take Virginia, especially Richmond, and thus end the war. You may have heard about George McClellan and conflict with Abraham Lincoln, McClellan having the slows. This is also when Robert E. Lee comes into prominence, helping along with Stonewall Jackson to defend Richmond from the United States Army. If the United States had taken Richmond in 1862, you need to remember, the war might have ended and 
ended without the end of slavery because in 1862, that had not been declared as the purpose. The result of that failure was this election. This is a, a map of congressional voting. Um, and you'll see that it only has the United States in it because the, the South, the Confederacy is at war. And what you see here is large areas that are controlled, that are won by the party of the Democrats, opposed to Abraham Lincoln. What this means was, if there had been a presidential election in 1862, Abraham Lincoln would not have won. That, this is the reaction against the first years of the war. So you need to remember how much opposition there was to Abraham Lincoln and also how hard it was to, to, to defeat the Confederacy. So that's 1862, Democrats come back into power. 1863 then came as what you've undoubtedly heard of as the, the pivotal point of the Civil War, Gettysburg, except that it was not pivotal in a military sense. There was many battles fought after Gettysburg as before, and as many people died. It would have been pivotal if the Confederacy had won because it would have eroded support for Lincoln. And Robert E. Lee tells his wife that's why he's going to Pennsylvania to show the North that Lincoln cannot protect them. But as it was, Gettysburg left both sides to fight some of the most costly battles of the war. The fall of Vicksburg at the same time was far more important strategically, but even with that victory in 1863, Lincoln's reelection remains in doubt. And that brings us to 1864. The story there is similar to 1862. The U.S. wins battles across the South, but cannot take Virginia. This helps explain the role that Robert E. Lee plays in the story of the Confederacy. He keeps the war from ending by holding off the United States in Virginia. In August 1864, Lincoln and most Republicans do not think he's going to win. And if William T. Sherman does not take Atlanta in September, and if the United States does not take the Shenandoah Valley, which runs right into Washington, it's been contested throughout the war, a few weeks later, Lincoln does not win. Here's what the election looks like in any case. See all the blue areas? And they're across the, the, the entire United States. What this means is that only 1% of the Democrats who voted against Lincoln in 1860 voted for him in 1864. In the midst of the greatest crisis of the nation. Think about that. That means that over 45% of white Northern men will not support Abraham Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War. After Gettysburg, after the Gettysburg Address, after the fall of Atlanta and the Shenandoah Valley. So what this tells us is that the conversion of public opinion to the new cause of combining emancipation and saving the union was the greatest political accomplishment in American history. It came through mass mobilization, the persuasion of a new political party, the Republicans, which are less than a decade old at this time, and absentee votes by United States soldiers in the field played a critical role in Lincoln's reelection as well. All of these struggles at the ballot box as well as on the battlefield remind us that we are fortunate that the United States survived and should be grateful for that deliverance rather than smugly certain that it was destined from the outset. Many people act as if, of course, the United States was going to triumph. Of course, slavery is going to come to an end. Of course, Abraham Lincoln was going to win, but that's by no means certain. Now, the third plot line in our story is both the most straightforward and in many ways the most powerful. From the first moments of secession, enslaved people did everything they could to escape and then destroy slavery. 200,000 African-American men played critical roles in preserving the United States as well as in, in winning black freedom. They were not to fight, able to fight until January of 1863. But just in the remaining time of the war, 200,000 came to the aid of the United States. That's more than all the men from both sides at Gettysburg. Others, women as well as men, young and old, sometimes far from the battlefront, created opportunities from the smallest openings, making emancipation conceivable and then possible and then real. They freed themselves over and over again. Now, this map is a heat map 
that shows the areas where African American people and the United States Army came into the greatest amount of contact. So you'll see in Virginia where so many of the battles were and where so many enslaved people lived. You'll see along the Atlantic coast where the United States Navy uh, took early possession of many islands, especially around Charleston and Sea Islands, but also up and down the Mississippi River and along the Tennessee River uh, that cuts ac across the South. What you'll see here is that the over half a million Black people came into contact with the United States Army. They escaped slavery and went to the aid of the United States within three weeks of Virginia's secession. They went to Fort Monroe that we'll look at in a moment. That, and so by this time, Virginia has had slavery for more than 200 years, but within three weeks of there being an ally of the United States Army at Fort Monroe on the Atlantic coast, it begins to uh, erode. And matter of fact, so you can see the, the red square there. Uh, that's where Fort Monroe is. You can see it's in Virginia. So this is kind of puzzling sometimes. The United States controls the United States forts there in Virginia, and it's a, a foundation on which they can supply these large armies. One reason they thought that Richmond would fall is that the United States could ship in so much men and material directly uh, to the James River and and get it to Richmond. We also see that the, the square farther down is the Sea Islands, um, where there were so-called rehearsal for reconstruction in the 18, during the war itself, uh, in which people would experiment to see what might the post-slavery world look like. But there are also these camps up and down the Mississippi River, where every United States Army went, African-American people escaped to the United States Army who had to build these refugee camps. Now, it turns out 100,000 Black people may have died during the war uh, from diseases and hunger that they suffered uh, during the war, including uh, in the refugee camps. Contrary to what you may have heard, the Confederacy never mobilized meaningful numbers of Black men to fight for the Confederacy. Black people were forced to labor on defenses and in camps, but they went to the United States side whenever they had the chance. So despite the involvement of half a million black Southerners with the US Army, more than three and a half million never came within reach of the US Army. You will have heard recently about Juneteenth as a holiday that's traditionally celebrated by black Americans. That is when uh, in Texas, um, black people were actually able to act upon their freedom because the United States Army arrived. That's what Juneteenth is about. So that's June after the war ends in April. Gives you some idea of the obstacles against uh, emancipation. So here's the, what you need to remember. Without military victory over the Confederate Army, there could have been no emancipation. Although slavery began to instantly erode with the war's beginning, it was not destroyed until even after the war's end. Slavery was destroyed by war. White Southerners never agreed to end slavery, and most white Northern Democrats resisted it. If you just had a poll of how many white Americans wanted to end slavery, it would not have won. It was won in the war against great obstacles by the United States. But what this means is that the meaning of freedom remained open at the end of the Civil War. And this brings us to Reconstruction. Now, people know some things about Reconstruction, many of them partially true. We know that Reconstruction followed the Civil War and apparently lasted 12 years, since that's when volume one of the U.S. history textbook ends and volume two uh, it begins. But there's no simple framework of the sort that we used to make sense of the Civil War, even incorrect frameworks like Gettysburg being a turning point. There seems to have been largely chaos sliced in different shapes for each Southern state. So we understand Reconstruction better if we think of it not as the aftermath of the Civil War, but as the culmination of the Civil War. The same people, after all, were fighting over the same issues on the same landscape. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau begins before the war actually ends, helping to avert starvation and delay the foundation for a post-emancipation society. They aided family members who had been sold apart in slavery, some during the war itself, and they aided Black people in starting their own schools and supporting white people who came from the North to teach and to help as well. 
But it soon became clear that black people and Republicans were up against former Confederates who bitterly fought against everything that formerly enslaved people needed to create new lives for themselves with nothing but the shirts on their backs. White Southerners immediately began to look for other means to dominate formerly enslaved people, legally, as in the black codes instituted immediately after the war, and illegally, as in violence against black people that would be inflicted for generations to come. In the meantime, Reconstruction turned around the political integration of the United States. After two years of struggle under Andrew Johnson, the Republicans finally declared that voters in the South must choose to rejoin the United States by writing new constitutions that acknowledge the end of slavery in the 13th Amendment and the rights of citizenship and due process for all Americans, including those who have been held in slavery in the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is the most important amendment to the Constitution, and it's a direct product of Reconstruction, of ways of guaranteeing that people, even those born in slavery, had the rights of all American citizens. When the Southern states had written new constitutions, then they could apply for readmission to the United States after they'd been under the supervision of the United States Army. So this is called military reconstruction. And here's a, a fact that people don't realize. This starts two years after the war because the two years uh, between Appomattox and the beginning of reconstruction have been overseen by Andrew Johnson who wanted to change as little as possible. who wanted to get the union back together as quickly as possible by which he meant white people. And he was willing to sacrifice the rights of black people in the process. There's riots against black people in New Orleans and Memphis and violence against them across the South. This is when the Ku Klux Klan is born. So the Republicans of the North say, apparently the white South is not going to uh, accept defeat. Uh, we're gonna have to have these new constitutions. And here's the thing, black men will vote for delegates to these new constitutional conventions and in fact, may be elected as delegates to those conventions. And black men, with the encouragement of their wives and the women and their families, voted in extremely high numbers, like high as, twice as high as our voting turnout today, and helped write new constitutions. What did those constitutions do? They created radical things like the first public school systems in some parts of the South. White Southerners and many white Northerners criticized these constitutional conventions and the, the legislatures around them that in which black men were delegates as corrupt. But in many ways, what they were trying to do is create a whole new system in which black people could have anything like equity in their societies. So what you found is that dozens of black men served in the constitutional conventions and were elected to other offices, including the US Senate and the House. Now under reconstruction, the new constitutions came into law and the southern states were admitted to the United States one at a time in the late 1860s and early 1870s. The states with the largest proportions of black people, South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, came under the control of the Republicans. So let's go back and look at the congressional votes in 1870. So the areas that are blue are the Democrats, the areas that are red are the Republicans. And here in 1870, you can see that Mississippi is controlled by the Republicans. You can see Louisiana is. Southern uh, Alabama, you can see South Carolina is controlled by the Republicans. And this is Reconstruction at its heyday. If we go to 1872, look how in those places the Republicans have expanded uh, their power. Uh, they're strong in Eastern Virginia, Eastern North Carolina, the eastern half of Tennessee. Uh, and so this is, it. this is what we think of as Reconstruction. But white Southerners immediately mobilized to overturn this black political power, which they never recognized as legitimate. They said that black men should not be able to vote, uh, that they, they were not real citizens, that only six years before they'd been in slavery, and that this is a white man's country. As early as 1874, as we see here, look how it's turning blue. You can see how throughout most of the South, 
This is what white Southerners call redemption. They're redeeming the South. They're turning it from uh, Republican rule to Democratic rule. Now, this is confusing because your textbooks tell you that Reconstruction ends in 1877. This is what they're referring to. This is 1876. Look how democratic not only the South is, but much of the North is as well. What this means is that white Southerners who had many sympathizers all across what we might think of as the lower North, many large places of which had been settled by white Southerners, uh, and the Republicans are in the upper North. And what you see in the Compromise of 1877, the electoral votes uh, for president uh, are divided uh, in Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana. And that's what the, that the removal of troops from some of those areas in 1877 is seen as the end of Reconstruction. But as you can see, it's already been, it been before by um, white Southerners basically using legal and illegal means to take it over. So it's common to argue that Reconstruction failed, and we can see why. White Southern Democrats came back into control and maintained that control for the next century. But if we return to our beginning premise that the Civil War and Reconstruction can best be understood from three perspectives, we see a more complicated story that's actually easier to understand. From the viewpoint of former Confederates, they had lost a great deal. Everything they had claimed to be fighting for, in fact, but they kept to their story. They argued that secession had been fought on the highest standards of American values. They insisted that the war was not about slavery, but about the rights of the states, even though the only right they defended was the right to expand slavery. And that's what the fights about the monuments that have been going on lately are about. The monuments proclaim that the Confederacy was a legitimate rebellion against the United States, and those who fought for the Confederacy were patriots, neglecting the fact that had the Confederacy won, it would have severed the United States and created a separate nation based on the principle of perpetual bondage. From the viewpoint of the United States, the war had saved the Union and destroyed slavery. That's incredible accomplishments that should not be taken for granted. But future presidents and Supreme Court justices of the U.S. decided that that was enough, that black equality and freedom would be postponed for another generation. They kind of made a deal with the South, the white South. You can be in control of what happens down there. You can put segregation in place. You can disfranchise black voters, but uh, the Republicans will be in control of the, of the biggest policies of the nation. So because the United States postponed fulfilling what Reconstruction had promised, it was five more generations when black Southerners themselves led the great moral revolution that we call the Civil Rights Movement. All the segregation and disfranchisement and violence could not stop them. That's one reason they emphasize so much that it's a nonviolent protest because they had suffered so much violence. And that reminds us of this. Black people's lives were not determined by what white people did. They did not wait to reestablish their families, to build their own schools, to start their own churches and organizations and businesses. And it's too easy to assume that because white Americans failed to deliver on the promises of Reconstruction, that black Americans failed too. Now this final map shows it looks not unlike the map I showed before. It's a little surprising. This is where black Americans chose to move in the last decade of the 19th century. This is more than a quarter of a century after the Civil War has ended. They're still moving to the Deep South, and especially to the Mississippi Valley, but also to Texas. Why? Well, if you are a sharecropper, you get half of what you grow. You want to move to a place where you can grow a lot. So they are moving to the richest soil where cotton, and the South produces much more cotton in 1900 than it had in 1860. You get a share of that crop. Mississippi Valley is just now turning into the Mississippi Delta in the terms of being the woods being cleared and cotton grows so high, you have to pick it on a horseback. So black Southerners are not waiting for the great migration they are moving inside the South. And look at the areas of a concentrated Black movement. They're moving to New Orleans. They're moving to Memphis. They're moving to Birmingham, a new city where they can work in the industry. They're moving to Atlanta. Okay? They're moving to Louisville. 
they are moving to the cities of the South, unless you live in the Upper South. If you're in Virginia, Virginia is still losing black population because it's only a train ride or a boat ride to Philadelphia or New York or Boston. So hundreds of thousands of black people leave the South before the Great Migration. So the lesson of this brief lecture is this. Often, to understand history, you have to take it apart before you can put it back together in ways that make more sense. As you see from this AP materials, we've covered a lot of territory, but we've done it in a way that sort of took it out of its boxes and put it together in new forms. You see here, it talks about the failure of reconstruction as something you're supposed to debate. We're also talking about government policies, military conflict. You can see how all these things fit together, how reconstruction is part of the same story of the Civil War. So in order to understand these things, sometimes you need to forget some of the stories you've heard and write new ones based on evidence and thinking for yourself. So I want to thank the folks who helped make it possible to make these beautiful images for you. Also to thank the, the, the folks at the college board who allowed me to have this opportunity. And I want to thank you for being with us today and I, I really wish you well in your studies.